Primary Source Reader 2301, World History to 1500 by Dr. Joshua Pham. This is for the response papers, and this is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Introduction, the Epic of Gilgamesh is one of the oldest surviving literature in the world and is a great source for understanding early Mesopotamian society. The story is based on a historical person, Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk, around 2700 BCE. Even though much of the story is more legend, myth, than history, we can still learn a lot about Mesopotamian society during that time through the Epic of Gilgamesh. The following two paragraph is a short summary of the whole story. Gilgamesh, a mighty king of Uruk, who is one third man and two thirds gods, abuses his power and oppresses his people. The gods created create a wild man, Enikidu, to rival Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh has a prophetic dream about coming the coming of Enikidu. Enikidu opposes Gilgamesh. They fight but become friends. However, peaceful life causes them to grow lazy. So Gilgamesh proposes an adventure, a journey to the far-off cedar woods, in order to fight fearsome wood demon. On the journey to the woods, Gilgamesh has a series of dreams. Enikidu loses heart and Gilgamesh begins to fight the wood demon alone. But Enikidu rallies and takes the lead in the epic battle with the wood demon, who curses Enikidu, predicting his life will be short. Enikidu and Gilgamesh cut down the forest to celebrate their victory, they realize that standing together, two can prevail. After the two return to Uruk, Gilgamesh rejects the advances of the goddess Ishtar, who has her father send down a bull to destroy this royal city. Enikidu takes the lead in killing the bull. The gods decree vengeance in Enikidu, who falls ill and dies. Gilgamesh is devastated. He mourns the loss of Enikidu, but builds him a monument in his desolation. Gilgamesh decides to embark on a journey to the underworld to seek the meaning of life and death. Gilgamesh encounters and surmounts various obstacles on his journey, scorpions, mountains, and frightening dreams. But he finally meets a wise innkeeper who tells him that death cannot be avoided. He presses on in his travels until he meets the Lord of the Underworld, a survivor of the Great Flood. Gilgamesh hears this, his story and fails a test to put him in. A snake also ruins his chance at immortality. He travels wearily back to the city of Uruk with only the story of his adventures to comfort, comfort him. Questions for response paper. Describe the relationship between the people of Uruk and Gilgamesh. Also, what were the gods like in this society? And what is was the relationship between the people of and their gods? The three modes of human existence at the at that time were hunter-gatherer, pastoral nomad, and agriculturalist. Based on the process of Inikidu, underwent from a wild to a civilized man. What were the characteristics of each lifestyle and what was the attitude of the Mesopotamian Mesopotamians at the time towards each type of lifestyle? Based on in Akidu's dream about his imminent death, what was the Mesopotamian view of the afterlife? What was the advice from Sidiri to Gilgamesh as he searched for immortality? For those who are familiar with the story of the Great Flood and Noah and the, in the Christian Bible, what are some of the similarities and differences between the flood story of Noah and of the story of Uptnaphysitism? And why do you think these similarities exist? Based on what you read, what was the Mesopotamian's worldview? And can you think of some factors that might have contributed to the worldview? Primary text selections of Epic of Gilgamesh. I will proclaim to the world the deeds of Gilgamesh. This was the man whom all things were known. This was the king who knew the countries of the world. He was wise. He saw mysteries and knew secret things. 
and he bought, brought us a tale of the days before the flood. He went on a long journey, was weary, worn out with labor. Returning, he rested. He engraved on a stone the whole story. When gods created Gilgamesh, they gave him a perfect body. Shamash, the glorious sun, endowed him with beauty. Adad, the god of the storm, endowed him with courage. The, two, the great gods made his beauty perfect, surpassing all others. Terrifying like the great wild bull. Two-thirds they made him a god and one-third man. Gilgamesh went abroad in the world, but he met with none who could withstand his arms till be came to Uruk. But the men of Uruk muttered in their houses, Gilgamesh sounds the toxin for his amusement, his arrogance, his no bounds by day or night. No son is left with his father, for Gilgamesh takes them all, even the children, yet the king should be shepherd to his people. His just his lust leaves no virgin to her lover, neither the warrior's daughter nor the wife of no of the noble. Yet this is the shepherd of the city, wise, comely, comely, and resolute. The gods heard their lament. The gods of heaven cried to the Lord Uruk, to Anu, the god of Uruk. A goddess made him strong as a savage bull. None could withstand his arms. No son is left with his father, for Gilgamesh takes them all. And is this the king, the shepherd of his people? His justly just leaves no virgin to her lover, neither the warrior's daughter nor the wife of the noble. When Anu heard, had heard their lamentation, the gods cried to Arur, the goddess of creation, you made him, O Aurora, now create his equal, and noble Enikidu was created. There was virtue in him of the god of war, of Ninurtu himself. His body was rough. He had long hair like a woman's. It weighed like the hair of Nisaba, the goddess of corn. His body was covered with matted hair like a Sumagans the god of cattle. He was innocent of mankind. He knew nothing of the cultivated land. Next, a harlot was sent to tame domestic, domesticate civilized Inikidu. She, the harlot, was not ashamed to take him. She made herself naked and welcomed him, welcomed his eagerness. As he lay in the murmuring love, she taught him the woman's art. For six days and seven nights, they lay together, for Enikidu had forgotten his home in the hills. But when he was satisfied, he went back to the wild beast. Then, he, then when the gazelles saw him, they bolted away. When the wild creatures saw him, they fled. Enikidu would have followed, but his body was bound as though with a cord. His knees gave way. When he started to run, his swiftness was gone, and now what the wild creatures had all fled away. Enikidu was grown weak, for wisdom was in him, and the thoughts of a man were in his heart. So he returned and sat down at the woman's feet and listened intently to what he, she said. You are wise, Enikidu, and now you have become like a god. Why do you want to run wild with the beasts in the hills? Come with me. I will take you to strong-walled Uruk, to the blessed temple of Ishtar and of Anu, of love. And lo heaven there, Gilgamesh lives, who is very strong. And like wild bull, he lords it over men. She divided her clothing in two, and with the one half she clothed him, and with the, her, the other herself, and holding his hand, she led him like a child to the sheepfolds, into the shepherd's tents. Shepherds crowded round to see, see him. They put down bread in front of him, but in, in, in Kidu 
could only suck the milk of the wild animals. He fumbled and gaped at the lo at a loss what to do or how should eat how he should eat bread the bread and drink the strong wine. The woman then then the woman said, "In Ikidu, eat bread. It is the staff of life. Drink the wine. It is the custom of the land." So he ate till he was full, and drank strong wine, seven goblets. He became merry, his heart exulted, and his face shone. He rubbed down the matted hair of his body, and anointed himself with oil. In Kidu had become a man, but when he had put on man's clothing, he appeared like a bridegroom. Next, Enkidu meets Gilgamesh. They fight, but become friends. However, peaceful life causes them to grow lazy. So Gilgamesh proposes an adventure, a journey to the far-off cedar woods in order to fight a fearsome wood demon. After the two return to Uruk, Gilgamesh rejects the advances of the goddess, goddess Ishtar, who has her father send down the bull of heaven to destroy them. Enikidu takes the lead in killing the bull and insulting Ishtar in the process. The gods decided one of them must die. Enikidu has a dream which foreshadows his death. As Enikidu slept alone in his sickness and bitterness of spirit, he poured out his heart to his friend. Listen, my friend, this is the dream I dreamed last night. The heavens roared and earth rumbled back in answer. Between them stood I before an awful being, a somber face man bird he had directed on me to his purpose. He was a vampire face. His foot was a lion's foot. His hand was an eagle's talon. He fell on me and his claws were in my hair. He held me fast and I smothered. Then he transformed me so that my arms became wings covered with feathers. He turned his stare towards me and he led me away to the palace of Urkala, the queen of the darkness, to the, to the house from which none who enters ever returns. Down the road from which there is no coming back, there is the house whose people sit in darkness. Dust is their food and their and clay their meat. They are clothed like birds with wings for covering. They see no light. They sit in darkness. I entered the house of dust and I saw the kings of the earth. Their crowns put away forever. Rulers and princes, all of all those who once wore kingly crowns and ruled the world in the days of old. They, have, they who had stood <clears throat> in the place of the gods like Anne and Enil and Lil stood now like servants to fetch baked meats in the house of dust to carry cooked meat and cold water from the, the water skin. Next, Enikidu falls ill and dies. Gilgamesh mourns and fears his own death. He decides to visit Atenopshtim, excuse me, in the underworld, who is legendary for wisdom and has attained immortality to find answers. Gilgamesh has various encounters along the way, one of which is a wise innkeeper who is actually Sidur Siduri, the goddess of brewing and wisdom. She advises Gilgamesh, because of my brother Enkidu, I am afraid of death. Because of my brother, I stray through the wilderness and cannot rest. But now young women, young woman, maker of wine, since I have seen your face, do not let me see the face of death, which I dread so much. She, Siduri, answered, Gilgamesh, why are you hurrying too? You will never find that life for which you are looking. When the gods created man, they allotted him death, but life they retained in their own keeping. As for you, Gilgamesh, fill your belly with good things, day and night, night and day. Dance and be merry, feast and rejoice. 
Let your clothes be fresh, bathe yourself in water, cherish the little child that holds your hand and make your wife happy in your embrace. For this too is the lot of man. Gilgamesh presses on and meets Utan Pishtim, a survivor of the great flood. Oh, Father Etan Bishop, you have entered the assembly of gods. I wish to question you, question you concerning the living and the dead. How shall I find the life for which I am searching? Utan Bishop said, there is no per permanence. Do we build a house to stand forever? Do we seal a contract to hold for all time? Do brothers divide an inheritance keep to keep forever? Does the flood time of rivers endure? It is only the nymph of the dragonfly who sheds her lava larva and sees the sun in his glory. From the days of old, there is no permanence. The sleeping and the dead, how alike they are. They are like painted, like a painted death. What is there between the master and the servant when both have fulfilled their doom? When Anunnaki, the judges, came to come together, and Mementin, the mother of destinies, together they decree the fates of men. Life and death they allot, but the day of the death they do not enclose. Then Gilgamesh said unto Uptif Shittim, I look at you now, Utnapshitim, and your appearance is no difference, different than mine from mine. There is nothing strange in your features I thought I should find. You're like a hero prepared for battle. But you are here, you, he, here, taking your ease on your back. Tell me truly, how is it that you came to enter the company of the gods and to possess everlasting life. Uptamnishim said to Gilgamesh, I will reveal to you a mystery. I will tell you a secret of the gods. Next, Uptamnishim tells the story of the great flood. You know the city Sherupak. It stands on the banks of Euphrates. That city grew old and the gods that were in it were old. There was Anu, Lord of the Firmament, their father and warrior Enlil, their counselor, Ninarti, the helper, and Enugi, watcher over the canals, and with them also was Ea. In those days, the world teemed, the people multiplied, the world billowed like a wild bull, and the great god was aroused by clamor. And Lil heard the clamor, and he said to the gods in council, The uproar of mankind is intolerable, and sleep is no longer possible. By reasons of the babel, so the gods agreed to exterminate mankind. Son of Ubabra, Tuta, Unafishitim, tear down your house and build a boat. In the first light of dawn, all my household gathered round me. The children brought pitch and the man whatever was necessary. On the fifth day, I laid the keel and the ribs. Then I made fast planking. The ground space was one acre. Each side of the deck measured 120 cubits, making a square. I built six decks below, seven in all. I divided them into nine sections with bulkheads between. On the seventh day, the boat was complete. For six days and six nights, the winds blew, torrent and tempest and flood overwhelmed the world. Tempest and flood raged together like warring hosts. When the seventh day dawned, the storm from the south subsided, the sea grew calm, the flood was stilled. I looked at the face of the world and there was silence. All mankind was turned to clay. When the seventh day dawned, I loosed 
a dove and let her go. She flew away, but finding no resting place, she returned. Then I loosed a swallow and she flew away, but finding no resting place, she returned. I loosed a raven. She saw that the waters had retreated. She ate, flew around, she cawed, and she did not come back. Then I threw everything open to the four winds. I made a sacrifice and poured out a libation on the mountaintop. Next, Gilgamesh finally learned how to dive under water to find a plant that would restore his youth, and Gilgamesh was able to find the plant. However, on the way back to Uruk, a snake slithered out and stole the plant. Gilgamesh wept. Oh, for all my labors, I achieved nothing. In the end, like all mortal, Gilgamesh dies. This is the end of Gilgamesh.